Bien. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, meeting you, although by distance, it's uh, somehow, it's been a few months like this, but it still is very awkward. I hope that we will be able to meet face to face uh, quite soon. Uh, nevertheless, I would like uh, to thank the Lebanese Fertility Society uh, the scientific committee and Dr. George Abitaya, the president, for uh, setting up such a nice event. Uh, so we'll have tonight uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rutmi, Dr. Zray, and uh, Dr. Hello. We will talk about freezing, about endometriosis, and about male uh, and about male uh, infertility. So I will uh, leave the floor to uh, Dr. Inam Khatoum to introduce uh, Dr. Ghutmi. Thank you, Dr. Namur. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, Dr. George Abitaya for inviting me to the second session of uh, the Lebanese Fertility Society webinars concerning Ishri Highlight 2020. We will start with Dr. Walid Ghutmi for the first topic, who is the chairman of the Eve Fertility Center and the president-elect of the Lebanese Fertility Society. Dr. Ghutmi, the floor is yours. Good evening. This evening, uh, we'll discuss about seven oral presentations that were presented in, uh, at the last virtual ASHRAE. Uh, they are all related to the topic of fertility preservation. I'm not being able to control my uh, slideshow. Sorry about that. So uh, the key points that shall be discussed are mainly, uh, first, we'll go through a lecture about pre-cooling ovarian tissue prior to preservation. And the study aim is to prove that pre-cooling ovarian tissue prior to cryopreservation will not affect the survival of primordial follicles if uh, engrafted uh, tissues. The second lecture, uh, we'll discuss a new uh, strategy or a new chemotherapy protocol in the treatment of uh, advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, this chemotherapy protocol aims at the preservation of ovarian function. The third lecture shall be uh, a review or a follow-up, a 19 years follow-up uh, of patients with, uh, of cancer, female cancer patients with cryopreserved uh, ovarian tissues or cryopreserved uh, uh, oocytes and embryos uh, with their uh, fertility uh, outcome over 19 years. The fourth topic shall be again a follow-up uh, on male and female patients who had childhood cancers. Uh, then we'll talk about the a, a new uh, ovulation induction protocol uh, mainly addressed for patients with breast cancer uh, and in order to uh, uh, to decrease the toxic 
uh, all the, to, to decrease the uh, adverse effect of ovulation induction on estrogen receptor positive breast cancer patients. Uh, then we'll go briefly uh, and talk about a study uh, which deals with the effect of thyroid cancer treatment on uh, future fertility potential. And last, we will talk about the safety of IVF protocols in patients with a history of atypical endometrial hyperplasia and grade one endometrial cancer. First, uh, the first talk was presented by Briet Bjarka Dottir from the University of Oxford in the UK. And again, the study aim of this, uh, the study aim was to prove that delaying cryopreservation for up to 48 hours does not affect the ovarian tissue used for fertility preservation. Now, uh, this study was made or was uh, done on mice, and uh, the experimental uh, the experimental design used three female lambs, whereby they were uh, their ovaries were extracted, and they were. Uh, uh, fixed uh, and sent into two groups, one which is the uh, fresh uh, tissue group and the second was the cryopreserved uh, group. Now again, the cryopreserved group, they had uh, a 24-hour delay arm or another arm with 48 hours delay. Uh, and then all of these tissues were used for xenotransplantation into, uh, into mice. And the endpoint was, was to study uh, the primordial follicular survival in the xenotransplanted tissues and to compare the effect on these primordial follicles with fresh, uh, not cryopreserved tissue, uh, with fresh 24 hours delayed processed tissue fresh 48 hours delayed process tissue. Again, uh, the cryopreserved tissue, we had two groups, one with a 24 hour delay and one with 48 hours delay. And then the conclusion was that a processing delay of 24 hours at four degrees did not have any impact on the health of primordial follicles in fresh or cryopreserved tissues as tested in the, uh, in the grafted uh, tissues in mice. Now, and this is consistent with all other studies. However, a processing delay of 48 hours at four degrees had a negative e impact on the primordial follicle morphology in fresh tissues. However, it did not have any uh, negative impact on cryopreserved tissue and thus, the conclusion was that pre-cooling ovarian tissue prior to cryopreservation may help uh, improve on the primordial follicular uh, outcome in uh, grafted uh, tissue. Now, the next topic was about uh, ovarian function recovery in newly diagnosed advanced cases of Hodgkin's lymphoma treated with chemotherapy. And again, the purpose of this study was to try to introduce a new chemotherapy protocol whereby uh, we shall have less toxic effects on the ovaries and thus prevent uh, 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 the detrimental effects on the fertility potential of the, those women. Uh, now, the lecture started with, the, uh, with showing the evolution of cancer survival rates in advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma over the last 60 years, which have shown uh, a remarkable improvement uh, with survival rates reaching up to 90-95%. And the two most common chemotherapy regimens used in such cases, which are the BCOP uh, and the ABVD, 
the big up being the traditional uh, chemotherapy agent whereby uh, about six cycles of BCOP are usually used, and these are associated with severe detrimental effects on ovarian function. The study, uh, in this study, uh, the study group received two cycles of BCOP followed by four cycles of ABBD as compared to the traditional chemotherapy regimen of six cycles of BCOP. And uh, follow-up of these patients over a period of two years showed that uh, the, the, the detrimental effect on the ovarian function as manifested by an increase in FSH and the decrease in AMH was much less in patients who uh, received ABVD uh, instead of the BCOP uh, regimen. Uh, the fertility potential in the study group was much better. Uh, and the importance of this study is that this is considered as the first prospective study that analyzes the reproductive outcome uh, in this uh, new uh, chemotherapy regimen uh, in patients with advanced Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, and it should encourage us to be more involved in more oncological trials to improve on the reproductive outcomes and provide accurate prospective data for fertility preservation counseling. Uh, the third presentation was made by a Lebanese young doctor, Dr. Dalia Khalifi, uh, who was spending her fellowship at the, in London at St. Thomas. And it was like a review, a 19 years review from the HIFA registry of the life birth rate and the utilization, utilization rate of eggs and embryos, which were uh, frozen from patients, uh, from 879 female cancer patients since the year 2000 until the year 2019. Uh, now, the lecture started by, uh, ex by uh, putting the expectations over the next 15 years and the projections of cases of female cancer in the UK. And it ex it's expected that by the year 2000, 2035, about 245,000 ladies shall have cancer uh, as compared to 130,000 female cases in 1993. Of course, most of these cases are breast cancer patients, uh, accounting for about one third of the cases. Uh, the study aim was mainly to see. Uh, how much of these patients used their frozen eggs and embryos, and what was the outcome? Since our knowledge is very limited still regarding the uh, outcome of oocyte freezing, we know for a fact that the uh, pregnancy rate from frozen oocytes is still very low, and until the last published data, uh, about two years ago at the HIFA, uh, the pregnancy rate was extremely low with documented 17 or 18 pregnancies so far. Uh, the, the importance of this study was uh, that it was a prospective cohort study and it studied about it followed about 373 patients out of the uh, 879 cancer patients. And those 373 patients had uh, frozen embryos, about 40.7% had frozen embryos, 53% had o uh, frozen oocytes, 5% had embryos frozen, and less than 1% had ovarian tissue frozen. 
the conclusion in this study was that uh, the usage of these embryos or oocytes uh, was as low as 16% over a period of 19 years. Uh, and the pregnancy rate was acceptable. It was uh, about 37% with frozen embryos. However, with uh, frozen eggs, the pregnancy rate was very low. However, the number of patients using the frozen oocytes was very uh, low. Now, this study can be used to urge oncology doctors, to urge uh, all the medical facilities, and to urge the uh, patients to refer their cancer patients very early for fertility uh, preservation protocols. Uh, since th this is a very efficient uh, process, we can stimulate patients with double dual stimulations over a period of one month. We can stimulate their ovaries twice, get uh, two yields of uh, follicles in one month, uh, and uh, this shall increase the utilization rate uh, in the future among those cancer patients, uh, knowing that uh, the pregnancy rate in, from embryos, uh, from frozen embryos, is acceptable, and knowing that. Uh, with vitrification, we expect that the pregnancy rate of oocytes shall prove to be better in the coming few years. Uh, this study is similar again to the previous one. It's a long term follow up, uh, long term fertility and pregnancy outcome uh, follow up. It, however, in men and women with a history of childhood cancers. It's a study done by uh, Musumi Das et al. at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London, UK. Uh, and it briefly, it shows that the, preg the uh, reproductive outcome of cancer, of childhood cancer survivors, uh, is lower in males who had childhood uh, cancer. Uh, then in females. As you can see, males who had childhood cancers have a much lower reproductive potential than their uh, peers uh, as compared to females who, uh, the, uh, who, who, be, uh, who showed a better uh, reproductive potential uh, than the male uh, patients as seen in this slide. The, The use of IVF is more in patients with childhood cancers, of course, and again, it is statistically significant in uh, male factor infertility and in pa male fa patients who had childhood cancer as compared to females. Uh, and as a conclusion, the childhood cancer survivors were less likely to have a child, a biological child by the age of 37. Uh, cancer survivors are more likely to report difficulty conceiving. Uh, higher requirements of ART in cancer survivors, and this is mainly uh, with more with males rather than with females. And this is, uh, as I said, the differences were generally more pronounced in males. It's uh, interesting to see that there's a higher risk of preterm birth in females with childhood cancers. Now, this study is about a new strategy or a new protocol, ovulation induction protocol, which is uh, suggested by Ivy uh, in order to address patients with breast cancer and these pro uh, the ovulation induction aiming at oocyte uh, vitrification with, uh, with an attempt to decrease the detrimental effects of ovulation induction on uh, breast cancer patients.
Now, again, the study uh, was done on mice. And as you can see, we had two groups of quote unquote patients. And these two groups of mice uh, were randomized into uh, controls and uh, tumor cell monitoring uh, group. And in the tumor cell group, uh, these mice were injected with one million cells of uh, tumor cells into the left renal kidney. And uh, one group of them was injected with FSH during the ovulation induction. The other group, uh, we, they used nitrozole or aromatase inhibitors on it. Uh, the other control group, again, they used FSH on a group of them and litrozole on the other group. Now, these patients were monitored over a period of 150 days after the uh, stimulation. And as you can see uh, in the radiology pictures here, you can see that the tumors uh, increased in size in the group of patients who received FSH as compared to the group of patients who received uh, aromatase inhibitors. Concluding that controlled ov ov uh, ovarian stimulation with FSH involves a higher estradiol concentration and thus increasing the tumor cell proliferation and possible metastasis, while the stimulation with litrozole main, mainly is associated with a lower estradiol concentration or elevation and with less tumor uh, growth. Uh, and these results can be considered essential in reassuring the current indications for fertility preservation techniques and counseling to patients and healthcare professionals. In summary, it provides evidence that we can stimulate patients with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer with litrozole uh, safely and without any risk of uh, increase in the tumor size. Again, this is a study or a lecture. Uh, about thyroid cancer treatment and if it is associated with uh, subsequent uh, fertility impairment. Again, the study aim or the study question of this lecture of this uh, is thyroid cancer treatment associated uh, with decreased infertility potential or not. Now, the Study There was 4,926 patients who were studied, and the age at cancer diagnosis was at 31 years of age. Uh, the infertility incidence was at 11 percent in this group. And the age and fertility diagnosis was at 35 years of age. Uh, so the conclusion was that in these results, we find that this is very similar to the controls. And so the conclusion was that thyroid cancer treatments uh, with total thyroidectomy or total thyroidectomy with radiation as compared to subtotal thyroidectomy, does not appear to increase the risk of subsequent infertility diagnosis. In this study, uh, they found that subtotal thyroidectomy uh, may be associated with an increased risk of decreased fertility potential. Here is uh, a study about the effect of IVF on the recurrence rate in patients with endometrial atypical hyperplasia or grade one 
adenocarcinoma after uh, two years of remission. The study uh, was presented by uh, a French group and it was a retrospective, uh, it was a prospective study and it was done between January 2008 with a follow up with an 11 years follow up until July 2019. Now, as you can see, uh, patients who underwent IVF uh, did not have any increase in the recurrence rate as compared to patients who did not undergo IVF, uh, the expected recurrence rate in patients with grade one adenocarcinoma or even with atypical hyperplasia, within two years, it is expected to be high, as high as 40%. And it was shown that patients who undergo IVF uh, as compared to controls, they had the same recurrence rate uh, of 37% versus 42% uh, respectively. Uh, in addition, the pregnancy rate in patients with atypical hyperplasia was compared to controls, and uh, the pregnancy rate with patients with grade one endometrial cancer was 32% less than the 44% reported for patients with uh, hyperplasia. However, patients who got pregnant had a recurrence rate of about 22%, which is half the recurrence rate in patients who didn't get pregnant, which means that pregnancy may have a protective role in decreasing the recurrence rate of grade one endometrial cancer. So the conclusion was that IVF treatment does not increase the recurrence rate uh, in patients with endometrial cancer and in patients with atypical hyperplasia. Indeed, it increases the chances of pregnancy. Furthermore, pregnancy is a protective factor from recurrence. IVF treatment must be proposed easily after <coughs> for patients who have endometrial, grade one endometrial uh, cancer, and for patients with endometrial hyper, hyperplasia, especially after a period of two years of remission. And the, finally, the rate of recurrence in both groups who have IVF and who do not have, who didn't have IVF, is as high as 40%, which is very uh, comparable. I thank you very much, and I'm sorry for taking a little bit more than my time. Thank you, Dr. Gutman, for this interesting uh, topic. We will keep the questions till the end of the session. Dr. Hatoum, if you want to keep the, the questions till the end of the session, maybe we can move uh, with Dr. Zirai. Yes. Uh, Dr. Dr. Zirai, the floor, the floor is yours. Dr. Zre was disconnected, obviously. If you'd like to start with Dr. Hello, and then we'll come back to Dr. Zre. Okay, it's a good mix between uh, Gaini and Euro. So uh, we will, uh, Dr. Hello, uh, a good friend of mine and a colleague at Hotel Dieu de France Hospital, St. Joseph University, will brief us about the latest development in male uh, infertility. Dr. Hello, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Eli. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, I wanna thank uh, first the, the organizers for inviting me to talk about male infertility, uh, topics that were presented in Ishri 2020. I'll start with this presentation. It's about paternal contribution to embryo morphokinetics in a time-lapse incubator system. It was presented by Amanda Setti, a Brazilian group. Uh, well, we all know that ART outcomes are affected by uh, paternal age, ejaculation abstinence, uh, semen quality, DNA fragmentation, BMI and lifestyle. We know that Embryo, that maternal age and paternal age affect embryo development. The way ovarian stimulation is done and semen quality, the cultural media and intrinsic embryo quality. So the aim of their study was to investigate the impact of paternal age and semen quality on embryo morphokinetics events in a time-lapse imaging incubator. They studied, they gathered the, dat, the kinetic dat, data of, one, of 1,220 embryos in 139 ICSI cycles of male factor infertility couples. And they followed them for day five, up to day five. What we noticed here is that all patients had teratospermia. You see, terato, terato, and terato but uh, few had asthenospermia and oligospermia. In fact, the count was, was uh, the median was 131 million and the motility was 55%. So they noticed that the age is correlated with implementation, implantation rate, pregnancy rate, and embryo morphokinetics. Ejaculation abstinence time was correlated with implantation rate only and embryo morphokinetics and semen quality was correlated with embryo morphokinetics. So the older the patient is, the lesser its DNA integrity, the lesser its semen quality, and embryo development and ICSI outcomes. So they conclude, uh, they, uh, they tell us again about the importance of paternal contribution for the ART success. And they recommend a shorter ejaculation abstinence period for uh, male, infertile, uh, male infertility factors. And they propose that um, embryo transfer should be done at day five, not before. The second presentation is about low male testosterone uh, uh, results in a sub substantial decrease of fresh live birth rates in couples with non-male factor infertility undergoing IVF. So here we have non-male factor infertility. They do the testosterone level to see if it's correlated with lower or higher live birth rates. What we know is that LH stimulates lady cells to secrete androgens, and FSH stimulates sertoli cells to stimulate spermatogenesis. We know too that androgens go to the sertoli cells via androgen receptors, and they too stimulate on the, uh, spermatogenesis. So testosterone has a role in spermatogenesis. We usually dose testosterone in males for low sperm concentration in severe oligospermia or in azospermia. We dose it too in sexual dysfunction, especially when there is a low libido. And some clinical findings of specific endocrinopathy. In fact, the AAU says that, it says that uh, low testosterone has been observed in approximately 15% of infertile men. There is a study done in 2019 by Trussell et al who showed that if testosterone is lower than 264 nanogram per deciliter, we have significantly lesser normal morphology in semen. So the aim of their study was to evaluate whether male testosterone levels are associated with semen parameters and reproductive outcomes in couples with non-male infertility undergoing IVF. So the two indicators were uh, semen parameters and reproductive outcomes. So they studied, the, uh, they evaluate the effect on, uh, 
on sperm parameters and live birth rates. So patients were divided into two groups, those who have a lower testosterone than 264 and those who have normal testosterone. They found that low testosterone, less than 264, is significantly associated with lower LH and with, of course, lower testosterone and uh, lower sex hormone binding globulin. There was no correlation, significant correlation with the volume, semen volume, concentration, motility, and morphology. So no correlation with semen parameters. Here too, no correlation with semen volume, concentration, motility, and morphology. But they noticed that it is correlated, low testosterone is correlated with lower live birth rates. In fact, in the group of low testosterone, they had 13.2% live birth rates. And in the group of normal testosterone, they had 23.2% live birth rates. And it was uh, statistically significant. So the odds ratio for low testosterone group was significant. Total testosterone also had an odds ratio, a significant odds ratio. It means if you have a higher testosterone, you have higher live birth rates. And fetosterone, testosterone too. They conclude that low testosterone does not seem to affect semen parameters, but it may negatively affect semen quality. And more patients in the low testosterone group had below reference semen parameters, but it was not significant. Live birth rates of patients with non-male factor infertility and going IVF seem to be affected in case of low testosterone values. That was the second take home message. So the first was that uh, paternal age uh, uh, and the sperm uh, uh, semen parameters can affect IV, uh, ART outcomes. Second was low testosterone also can affect ART uh, live birth rates in IVF. The third uh, presentation is about the negative impact of elevated DNA fragmentation and the human papilloma virus presence in sperm on the outcome of intrauterine insemination. So we're studying the fragmentation and the presence of HPV on the intrauterine insemination results. We know that HPV variants bind to syndicon 1 receptor present at the equatorial uh, region of the sperm head and can transfer HPV variants to the oocytes. We know too that the transferred HPV variants also induce stage-specific maturation arrest in infected embryos. So the aim of the study was to determine the impact of fragmentation and the presence of HPV on fertility outcome, clinical pregnancy rate, in sperm before it's used in insemination, uh, intrauterine insemination. So they had 31 sperm samples from 169 different men who were HPV positive. So they had 15% prevalence of HPV per intrauterine uh, insemination cycle and 9-10% of high-risk HPV prevalence. Okay, they chose for the fragmentation, uh, high frag uh, fragmentation for fragmentation more than 26%. They, they found that HPV positive sperm samples had a significantly higher fragmentation compared to HPV negative samples. So if you have an HPV, you have more fragmentation. And none of the 31 insemination in which the sperm tested positive for HPV led to pregnancy. So as you see here, clinical pregnancy was zero in HPV positive samples. It was, they had 27 pregnancy in HPV negative samples. So they conclude that sperm fragmentation is an independent predictor of clinical pregnancy from partners uh, of women receiving intrauterine insemination. When fragmentation exceeds 26%, clinical pregnancies are less likely and in vitro fertilization techniques should be considered. They found that sperm sample containing HPV had a significant higher fragmentation compared to HPV negative samples, 29 versus 20. When infectious HPV variants were present in the sperm, no clinical pregnancy were observed. 
and they advise that routine examination of infertile couples and counseling before starting insemination treatment should include fragmentation and HPV measurements. Now for my fourth presentation, it was on extremely low level of serum AMH. Uh, they studied if it correlates with the high sperm retrieval rate of microtails. You would ask why AMH should correlate with with uh, sperm retrieval rate in microtasia in men with idiopathic azospermia. I'll present what they found. So we know that to retrieve sperm from non-obstructive uh, non azospermia, we can do open surgery. We can do tasia. So the red dots are where there is spermatogenesis. We can do tasia. It's random. And we can do microtasia to select where the sperm is, where there is a significant uh, uh, potential of spermatogenesis. Now, all studies talk about uh, lesser than 60% retrieval rate in microtasia. As for the conventional tasia, we have about 30 to 45% retrieval rate. We know that many things can affect the retrieval rate. Uh, and we know that other factors do not affect, like FSH, FSH uh, testicular volume. These do not affect the sperm retrieval rate. We know the retrieval rate in certain pathologies, like AZ, AZF, A, B, and C, and Kleinfelter. So what could be the relation between AMH and retrieval rate? So in their cohort of 40, uh, 484 cases of microtailsy, they had a, retriever, a high retrie uh, retrieval rate in orchitis, in cryptorchidism, in AZFC deletion, low retrieval rate in Kleinfelter syndrome. And in the idiopathic uh, population, they had a low retrieval rate. So they studied this group. They measured AMH in this group. And what they found is that low AMH is significantly correlated with non-retrieval of sperm in macrotasia. It means if you have low MAH, you're, uh, you're, uh, you have higher risk of not retrieving sperm in your macrotasia. When they divided MAH to below one, one to five, and more than five, they found that the retrieval rate is higher in the less than one nanogram per milliliter. And they talked about heterogeneous tubules. What are heterogeneous tubules? In fact, when we do microtasia, we, we, can, we can see that some of your tu tubules are small in diameter. And these are what they call high ionization, severe ionization uh, uh, seminiferous tubules, where there is no sertoli cells. And we know that when there is no sertoli cells, we have low AMH. And when the tubules are high ionized, we can see clearly the difference between tubules where there is a spermatogenesis and the hyaluronidite tubules. So it will be easier for the operator to distinguish between the good uh, seminiferous tubules and the bad seminiferous, seminiferous tubules. So their, their theory was that the tubules are very narrow when there is no sertoli cells. And AMH levels would be extremely low because of the, less, because of the loss of sertoli cells. And seminiferous tubules with spermatogenesis differ greatly from those with high ionization. Like here, we see here the tubules that are high, high uh, they, have, they have severe high ionization and the tubules where there is spermatogenesis. So for the operator, it's clear that this region should be selected. Now, when we have sertoli cell only, we see that all the tubules are homogeneous. So it's very difficult to know where we have better chance of finding spermatogenesis. Same for maturation arrest. You see all the tubules are homogeneous. So maybe there is no uh, great benefit for microtasia in these cases. So they say that ionization in seminiferous tubules uh, means less sertoli cells, means low levels of AMH. And it's, it, it gives more opportunity to present heterogeneous tubules. So microtasia shows an advantage and high sperm rate retrieval rates in, high, in low AMH. And for my last presentation, it's a randomized control trial about MAX versus TESA. 
for raised sperm DNA fragmentation. MUX is uh, magnetic activated cell sorting. So when we have high fragmentation, we can do, uh, we can select the sperm via MUX, for example, and we can uh, take testicular sperm because they, they, do, uh, they are not fragmented. We know that fragmentation happens in the epididymis. So when we have high fragmentation, what we do first, we treat the man by telling him to daily ejaculate. We give him some antioxidants. We try to treat the cause if there is a cause, like, inf like infection, varicocele, obesity, smoking, or alcoholism. And if not, we can do TESA to select testicular sperm with low fragmentation. And for sperm selection, we have many methods. In this randomized controlled trial, they use the MAX. The MAX magnetic activated cell sorting, we pass the sperm in a magnetic field and we select the better uh, spermatozoid for ICSI. So the objective was to randomly divide the patients with high fragmentation into MAX and TESA and aim to optimize their productive outcomes. So if they have a, a higher than 30% fragmentation, they randomized them into these two groups. They had 30 patients in MUX and 30 patients in TESA. What they found is that there is no significant difference between MUX and TESA in blastocyte conversion rates. But the difference was significant in clinical pregnancy rates. We have higher clinical pregnancy rate in the TESA group, 83 versus 50%. And we have higher implantation rate in the TESA group too, 72% versus 43%. So take home message was that couples with failed IVF attempts and raised sperm fragmentation, we can offer them a TESA as an, as an active intervention to optimize reproductive outcomes. That was all, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hello, for uh, this uh, nice overview of what's going on recently on male infertility. There are some concepts that we, didn't, we weren't familiar with before, like the AMH. Uh, we will leave the question till the end of the session. And now, I don't know whether Dr. Zrae is able to join us. If Dr. Zrae is with us. I'm on. Okay, uh, nice to have you back, Dr. Zrae. Dr. Zrae is the chairman of obstetric gynecology at uh, LAU uh, Medical Center. Uh, he will uh, update us on uh, the latest about endometriosis. The floor is yours, Dr. Zrae. Thank you, Dr. Nimmer. Thank you, Dr. Abitaye, and for the whole society for inviting me. Uh, while I prepare my thank you, for the science pro for organizing all of this. And let me just open the uh, presentation. Let me share again. Um, about endometriosis, uh, two studies or presentations were done at the ASHRAE. The first one was done by uh, Belgian and UK group, Dr. Uh, Bafour from Belgium. And they tried to answer the question of whether to operate or not in cases of endometriosis. And if you do operate, which surgical technique would be best for these patients? Whether it be excision, ablation, robot assisted, medical construction, radical. So basically, their objectives were 
to assess the effectiveness and safety of laparoscopic surgery in the treatment of pain and infertility. Uh, they tried to include them, looking at laparoscopy versus many different other interventions, such as robotic medicine. And what they tried to do is they used four outcome set. Uh, this was recently published by Duffy, one of the co-authors of the presentation. Uh, the core outcome set of endometriosis uh, was published in March of 2020. by a group of healthcare professionals, researchers, and women who suffer from endometriosis, looking at relevant uh, outcomes relevant for women who suffer from endometriosis. Now, in the study, they have... Uh, Outcomes being the overall pain symptoms and birth rates, while secondary outcomes were the quality of life and others. The PRISMA diagram that they used originally in a previous view. And two of those were excluded, two were ongoing, so they excluded them also, and they ended up with three studies in their uh, three plus the original and for a total of 30 studies to be included in this meta-analysis. First, they looked at the difference in outcome, pain outcome, between laparoscopic surgery versus just a diagnostic laparoscopy. Of course, the one study showed a favorable outcome uh, for pain relief uh, with surgical uh, intervention, laparoscopic surgical intervention. That was a very low quality of evidence because it was only based on one study, so you cannot do a meta-analysis for that specific outcome. In addition, they tried to look at live birth, and uh, they found none of those studies, the 13 studies, reported on live birth. So they took the next best thing, which is the viable intra for the live birth. They found three studies, all three of them favoring, favoring. Uh, laparoscopic surgery of their findings. Then they tried to answer which would be the best surgical technique, suspension, nerve transaction, ablation, excision, conservative radical, and the energy sources. Again, they really could not answer that question. Only one study that looked at excision versus ablation by laparoscopy uh, and the outcome, overall outcome for pain was not significant because the mean difference crossed zero. Uh, this is a very low quality evidence and they cannot, could not say much about this. Overall, in their conclusion, they found a lot of biases all these question mark in yellow, all these dots in yellow are biases they found in each of the studies they looked at. But they said that implication for practice, laparoscopy surgery versus diagnostic laparoscopy only, they found a very low quality evidence for the overall pain and moderate quality evidence for improvement of viable triuterine pregnancy rates. When they looked at ablation versus excision, very low quality evidence. 
uh, if any, in terms of overall pain between ablation and excision. And when they looked at different surgical techniques, it was not possible to draw any conclusion. Some uh, suggestions and reporting of outcomes using the core outcome set of endometriosis, and that further trials are required focusing on the different techniques used, the different subtypes of endometriosis, and looking at the comparison between medical interventions and the longer flow up will The second uh, presentation was uh, from uh, Italy, Genova, Italy, and they were looking at the long-term treatment effect of norethindrone acetate in decreasing the post-op recurrence of deep endometriosis on long-term follow-up. Now, norethindrone acetate is one of the currently available medical hormonal treatments for pelvic pain due to endometriosis. It is listed among the medications uh, on a five milligram daily dose. It has been previously published. This is the group by Mark Laufer uh, in 2012 in the Journal of Adolescent and uh, pediatric and adolescent gynecology, where they looked specifically at the use of norethindrone acetate alone for post-op suppression of endometriosis symptoms. In that study, their patients were about 19 years of age. The, the median pain scores and the bleeding scores significantly decreased due to the use of norethindrone acetate postoperatively in those adolescent patients. So in this, in this uh, presentation, which was done in a prospective manner, they tried to look at any role for norethidrone acetate in preventing recurrence of deep endometriosis in patients with endometriosis at large. Single center prospective study done between 2014 and 2019. Um, patients underwent surgical excision of deep endo and then received post-op treatment with either norethindrone acetate or no hormonal treatment at all. There was no third arm looking at other proven medical therapies. Their follow-up consisted of a transvaginal ultrasound every six months, looking for and assessing the presence of pain symptoms also using the visual, visual analog scale and looking quality at the quality of life using the endometriosis health profile 30, the EHP 30, and the sexual function of these patients using the uh, female sexual function index FSFI. The demographic pre-surgical characteristics were quite similar between the two groups in, in terms of age, body mass index, and what is, in, uh, what is interesting is that both groups had a similar percent of endometriomas concomitant with their deep endometriosis in about 40% of them. The mean follow-up was between 45 to 47 months um, for the study. The location of the endometriosis was similar between the two groups, whether it be in the deep nodules locations or the location of endometriomas. As you would expect, in general, we know that the left side is more inclined to have endometriomas. The left ovary is more prevalent in having endometrioma than the right, which is present in both groups at equal rates, non-significant. 
Now, this is a slide that looked at how many patients were adherent to the, the treatment, whether they received norethindrone acetate or no therapy at all. At 24 months, only 88% were uh, adherent to the protocol with norethindrone acetate, while only 81% were adherent to the no treatment. And if you look at the end of the study, 4% of the patients who were on norethindrone acetate were at the treatment protocol, whereas those with no treatment postoperatively, only 43% of them continued with the study. The looking at the recurrence of endometriosis by ultrasound. 5.2 at, this is at uh, six, six months, you have about 5.2% of patients on norethindrone acetate with the recurrence of endometriosis versus 17.2 on no treatment. And here is at 66 months, at the end of the study, you can see that more of the norethindrone patients were disease-free at the end of the study compared to the no treatment. You have 8.4% recurrence in the norethindrone versus 23.4% in the no treatment. Also, the norethindrone significantly decreased the risk of recurrence of deep endometriosis. You can see that at the end of the study, at 67 months, 7.4% of the norethindrone group had recurrence of deep endo versus 14.8%. And the location of these uh, deep endometriosis was similar in both groups. If they recurred, they can recur anywhere in the deep uh, pelvis. Now, also looking at recurrence of endometriomas, the norethindrone significantly reduced the risk of recurrence of endometriomas. As you can see, at the end of 66 months, only 1% of patients who received norethindrone had recurrence of endometriomas compared to 8.5% on no treatment. De novo deep endometriosis was also improved or decreased by norethindrone, 1.6% of the patients versus 7% in those who received no treatment. And in the deep, uh, de novo, deep endometriosis, the location also did not uh, change much, but you can see a small predilection for rectovaginal septum and uterosacral ligaments, deep endometriosis, more in the no treatment group. De novo endometrioma, slight improvement in the norethindrone, 3.2% versus 3.9%, still uh, significant, but not as much as the de novo deep endometrioma. What about the pain symptoms? The pain symptoms, all of them across the board, were significantly lower in patients treated with norethindrone, 10%, versus those who did not receive any hormonal hormonal therapy, 35.9%. The quality of life was better in those patients with receiving norethindrone acetate, better than those on no treatment, and the sexual function was also significantly better in patients treated with norethindrone versus no treatment. And if you see, this is a table summarizing the findings uh, that we mentioned in one table, all of them being uh, 
from adherence to recurrence of endometriosis lesions to recurrence of deep endo, recurrence of endometrioma, de novo endo lesions, de novo endometriomas, recurrence of pain, quality of life, and sexual function, all were significantly improved with the use of norethindrone acetate, the progestational agent. Limitations of the study was not randomized. It remains to be looked at if how does it compare to other hormonal, proven hormonal therapies for endometriosis recurrence. And in their conclusion, the authors stated that patients undergoing surgery for endo who do not desire to conceive immediately post-op should be advised to use post-op hormonal therapy to decrease the risk of endometriosis recurrence. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zre, for this uh, very concise and clear presentation. Uh, now uh, we will uh, we will answer the questions. We have uh, two from uh, the attendees that raised their hands. We have first uh, Dr. Uh, Al Jibouri. Can we give the mic to Dr. Dr. Al Jibouri? And we have also Dr. Shalhoub who raised his hands. So uh, please, Dr. Al Jabouri or Dr. Shalhoub. Carla? Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, I gave the access to Dr. Sarhu, but obviously he's not with us. Uh, he did not unmute himself. So we can take the questions in the Q&A. So in the Q&A, we have Dr. Barakat, who, uh, who asked the questions for a woman with adenocarcinoma. Are they treated for infertility before cancer treatment? So it's for Dr. Rotmi. Uh, no, for sure not. You cannot uh, you cannot take a patient with adenocarcinoma and uh, do IVF on her. We're talking about patients who are in remission, and these patients are at least two years in remission before they underwent IVF. Uh, if a patient has adenocarcinoma, even uh, grade one adenocarcinoma. Uh, they wouldn't start her on any IVF treatment before two years of remission. The study was about uh, uh, the recurrence rate after remission. Okay, perfect. Other questions for the panelists? Uh, Tufi Naba has asked me a question. He said, uh, what are your indications for asking for fragmentation? Uh, the indication to do fragmentation is when you have uh, multiple IVF failures. So sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Hello. So the, the question is, what are the indications for uh, doing a DNA fragmentation index? Yeah, AMH okay. level and testosterone levels. So a fragmentation, we ask for fragmentation when we, when we have... Uh, uh, multiple IVF failures and with no explanation for this uh, for these failures uh, AMH level I'm gonna start uh, doing it for uh, non-obstructive uh, azospermia with idiopathic uh, uh, with, with no cause with idiopathic cause so I'll, I'll do it and I'll see if uh, it really correlates with uh, sperm retrieval rate as for testosterone 
I'm not gonna change the way I work. I'm gonna do testosterone level and the whole hormonal uh, panel for uh, for patients with less than 10 million sperm per milliliter. Okay. If I may, uh, if I may add to this uh, yes. re regarding sperm DNA fragmentation. Yes, yes, of course, Dr. Rukmi. Yeah, it's more like a question for uh, the urologists, for you. Uh, we usually consider uh, uh, requesting sperm DNA fragmentation when we have a normal semen analysis, uh, normal semen analysis parameters with patients who have varicose, varicose. So do you think that it may uh, be of benefit to decide which candidate needs varicoselectomy and which candidate doesn't? Uh, very logic and nice question. Uh, in fact, the guidelines are clear about that. If you have a normal uh, sperm parameters, there is no indication for treating uh, varicocele. So in order to change this recommendation, we need uh, some uh, well-powered uh, studies. I don't think there's a study that says that treating varicocele in normal uh, uh, semen parameters patients will do good for fragmentation. But we know that varicocele is a cause of high fragmentation rate. So I suppose in the future we will be doing it. But to elaborate, to elaborate also on that, if you have a, a patient with a varicocele and abnormal sperm uh, count, uh, the DNA fragmentation index cannot uh, predict whether he will respond to surgery or he will not respond to surgery. So unfortunately, up till now, we don't have a tool in our hand, a predictive tool, to select patients and say, well, this one could profit from surgery or this one he can go directly to uh, ART. No, I'm asking about patients with normal semen parameters. Yeah, yeah. For normal, the Dr. Hello gave you the, the answer. And even for the abnormal, it doesn't help us a lot in trying to select patients. Yeah. Dr. Hatoum, do you want to take the answer, the, the, the we have question? Another, we have question. another question concerning uh, the use of norethindrone acetate in adenomyosis. I think it's for Dr. Zre. Yes, yes. Uh, well, the studies do not address uh, that. Although we, I think it will work like any other progestational agent, but uh, they did not uh, look at that. They only looked at uh, endometriosis and the pain related uh, to endometriosis. Thank you, Dr. Zire. Uh, another question from, from Dr. Sood. How would time lapse help in assessing male infertility patients? It will not help. Uh, another question from Dr. Jamil Shahab. In case of peritoneal endometriosis, if we do laparoscopic treatment, should we continue the medical treatment to prevent the recurrence? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, many people do routine. Uh, if it's extensive disease, then yes, definitely the patient would need to be postoperatively on uh, treatment. If, if not, you may, uh, especially those that want to get pregnant uh, immediately. Now, post-surgery, the best time to conceive the highest fertility period is between six months to a year post-surgery. 
Um, so if you do a good surgery, you're satisfied, and the patient wants to get pregnant, leave her be and let her take the best chance of getting pregnant. If she doesn't, if her main concern is pain, and if you have extensive disease, then post-op hormonal therapy would be beneficial. Thank you, Dr. Zred. Okay. If we have no more questions, I'd like to thank uh, all the attendees. We were more than 100 uh, uh, participants in this very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, I'd like to, to thank Science Pro for setting up this event. I'd like to thank also my colleague, Dr. Inam, for uh, co-chairing with me this, uh, this session. And uh, thanks to the Lebanese Fertility Society and uh, Dr. George Abitaya for those events in those difficult times. Hopefully, as I said at the beginning, we will see you soon face to face, uh, hopefully uh, very soon. Dr. Inam. Thank you, Dr. Nemer, and thank you, Dr. Abitaya. And uh, I remind you to save the date for the next Wednesday for the last session of the Lebanese Fertility Society. It's on the ne next Wednesday. Okay, bye. Thank Good evening for all of you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all our speakers, uh, Dr. Hutmi, Dr. Hello, and Dr. Zre for their excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Hutmi and uh, our president-elect uh, for the Lebanese Fertility Society. I want to thank also our chairman, Dr. Nimer. Thank you very much to be with us uh, this evening. And Dr. Hatoum, our it's young... It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you very thank you. much. And uh, yes, we are waiting for you, all attendees, for no, our next webinar next Wednesday. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for all attendees also.